Good evening, everyone. It's absolutely wonderful to see you on International Women's Day. Thank you so much for turning out tonight. My name is Katrina Makara, and I've written a text for uh, Sam Ainsley's exhibition, which you can find on the GOMA blog. I'd be really grateful and interested in your thoughts if you could get a chance to read that. Um, I've entitled the essay Amazing Ariadne, and that has a kind of double meaning. Um, so, very interested in the idea that um, that there's a maze for Ariadne, and also this idea that maybe Sam is also a kind of legendary Ariadne in her own right. Um, leading us through this exhibition and uh, with her recurrent use of red. Um, we um, both enjoy the work of Charlotte Higgins. You actually introduced me to her and her work. She's a journalist and she's written a wonderful book called The Red Thread on Mazes and Labyrinths. It came out in 2018 and it's um, been re repurposed for 2021. I really recommend reading it in connection with Sam's oeuvre um, because it leads to all kinds of fascinating revelations. So thank you for introducing me to that one, Sam. Um, it's really a tale about um, a contemporary revision of um, the myth of Ariadne, and I think it's written from a feminist perspective, which is really refreshing. Um, I just wanted to start maybe with a quick quotation from that, if I may. Mm -hmm. Sure. She began to make plans. When the whole palace was asleep, she got up. First of all, she fished out her work. It was a work basket full of a ball of red thread. <laughs> Not any red thread. It was as tough as the strongest rope and many miles long. Miraculous stuff. She had flinched from Daedalus long ago. <laughs> this she put in her pocket. Then, stealthily, she slipped into her artist's workshop. Ariadne had been the kind of small girl who'd learned to make herself inconspicuous. That way, she had found people said more than they meant to in front of her. Hoarding scraps and ends of knowledge had given her a fleeting sense of power. So, um, <laughs> I, found that, I found that productive when it came to yeah. looking at your work and engaging with your work, Sam. Um, and, yes, I guess my first question is about portability. How does the maze and this kind of cultural history which Charlotte Higgins gives us, how does that operate in your practice? Um, well, as you know, Katrina, I adored the book, the Charlotte Higgins book, for all sorts of reasons, not the least of which is uh, that Ariadne's thread was red, <laughs> that led Theseus out of the Minotaur's lair. I've been interested in Greek myths for a long time, but um, anyway, there, there was something about that idea that women's experience of the world is different to that of men. It's not better or worse, it's just different. And this has informed all of my work um, because although I try to make it um, <clears throat> relevant across the board, I think that I am speaking purely from a, a feminist perspective, a female perspective, and because of that, um, I think sometimes my work is misread as uh, something, um, I don't know what the word is, contentious, when in fact it is meant to be uh, a communal coming together uh, of different worldviews, of different possibilities, of different truths, different histories, you know, I've always been astonished at how different the histories are, depending on who's writing them. I remember my son coming home when we would, lived in Edinburgh with a child's Scottish history, and it was so radically different from the one I'd had in the northeast of England that I thought, well, <laughs> I have to get to the bottom of this. So, yeah, um, there are, I think, a lot of things in the book by Charlotte Higgins that relate to my sense of how women have been portrayed in 
history, how recent it is for women artists to even have recognition, maybe in the last century. Um, and I think also that it's been difficult for me as a tutor in an art school for 25 years to realise that the main obstacle for my female students has been lack of confidence. Mm -hmm. Not much else. They were certainly as good as, if not better, than their male compatriots. But anyway, that's another story. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Let's get back to the subject. It's another story, but it's a fascinating one. It's something I really want to ask you about tonight, actually, Sam, because... Um, Charlotte Rostec recently wrote in the Scottish Women Artists Catalogue that there is something now known as the Sam Ainsley effect. <laughs> and no, I mean it's true. You you have you have I'm taught so some of the most significant artists of our time, Christine Borland, Alana Halperin, you name it, you taught them. You know, that that's extraordinary actually. Um, but your work's quite different from theirs at first sight. Yeah. And I'm, I'm curious if you could tell me a little bit about the, um, the kind of overlaps that you might see within their work and yours. I'm so sorry. You need to share the microphone. Oh, okay. Is that mean it's on? It's on. Okay. Is that on? Can you hear? No? You need to switch it on. To be on it. Is that it? No, no. no. Sorry. When these things have worked in the test. <laughs> <laughs> you see, that's a red light. It should be green. Gives you time to think, though. But maybe it doesn't need. Do we need a microphone? Oh, oh. we have. <laughs> Lift off. <laughs> um, so the question was about. Um, Conceptual art yeah. and a painting practice, yes. I suppose. Mm. So, um, I grew up in the northeast of England, went to Newcastle to do my undergrad. Didn't see a female tutor, all my male tutors treated me as a hobbyist. Uh, one tutorial consisted of uh, a tutor saying, pass more fucker, uh, which he passed off as a tutorial. Uh, Chauvinism was alive and well. Uh, we've come a long way in half a century, but a long way to go. <coughs> but um, although I trained as a painter, I've diversified into various other areas. I took on commissioned work until I took up full time teaching. Um, I've always encouraged my students to think about what medium is the best way to show your ideas. It didn't matter to me what medium that was. It could be painting, it could be sculpture, it could be video, it could be sound, it could be performance, it could be anything. And it was the same throughout environmental art where I taught from 85 to 90 and setting up the MFA from 90 to 2005. Every student uh, I treated as an individual who needed to find the right words in terms of visual art for their practice. Um, and I think that, um, you know, that was part of the guiding philosophy that David Harding taught me when we uh, taught in environmental art in the undergrad, uh, where <coughs> students were invited to make public art projects in the city of Glasgow. And they were asked to choose a site that had resonance for them and to investigate the five contexts, which began with the physical, photographing it, drawing it, measuring it, whatever the site was, the psychological, what effect did the space have on you, the social, who uses the space and why, the political, were there any political repercussions to the site, and the historical, what research could you do to find out the history of the space. Now, that, excuse me, that idea of context has remained really important to me throughout my um, 
art career, um, who am I speaking to? And what am I speaking about? And why? And so, you know, you end up where ideas about whether it's painting or sculpture or conceptual art or new media art, actually in the end does not matter. The important thing is that the work is done in the full knowledge of its meaning and repercussions and its uh, contextual basis. And the fact that you can only do so much, you know, you, you, I believe art can have huge effects, but I don't believe I can do it. I believe that all artists together can do it because I believe it's a conceptual community in my head. <laughs> I mean, Glasgow's had a really brilliant art community for decades now, but uh, the rest of the world needs to catch up. Can I just answer your questions, Katrina? Would that be okay? Of course. Katrina sent me a few questions in the post, which I haven't had time to really think about, but I'll, I'll kind of go through them. Um, the first one was, are there any parallels <coughs> or points of contact between painting, sculpture, conceptual and new media art? <coughs> Excuse me. I was thinking about that the other day in relation to some of my female students, ex-female students, who have often worked across disciplines, you know, in a very cross-disciplinary way, you know, uh, Alana Halperin, Christine Ball, and Christ Kira Phillips, loads of people have worked with disciplines outside of art. And I think that's a relatively new phenomenon. Uh, certainly in art education, um, you know, me ringing up medical <laughs> departments in the university and saying, can my students come and look down at your microscopes? Uh, and a, a beautiful time. One of the phone calls I had was from the head of the Royal Society of Psychiatrists, and he said, Sam, would you come and talk about your students' work? to our annual convention in Glasgow, and I said, sure, but why? And he said, because an ability to tell one's own story is a sign of great, good mental health, mm. and artists are very good at that. Mm. And I thought that was really crucial. Anyway, uh, second question, what kinds of research are necessary for your practice? I've been asked this many times, and PhD academics used to get very cross with me when they asked that question and I said travel because <laughs> they said that's not valid and I said sure it is uh, so film and books 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 that has been standard throughout my life since childhood uh, my mother bought me a, an annual subscription to National Geographic <laughs> when I was a kid. And there was a whole issue on Japan and Japanese culture. And ten years later, I went to Japan as a student in Newcastle and it changed my life and it changed my view on cultural difference. Uh, how important is interpretive writing to my artwork? Well, it's very important. <coughs> Excuse me. An artist can learn so much about their work from what other people say about it or write about it or respond to it. I've had so many great responses to this exhibition that have floored me because they've asked questions that I'd never thought about. And they've made comments that I found incredibly useful. I'm a, just now embarking on a series of six new circular works and they're very uh, influenced by the responses I've had to this exhibition. How important is the curation of your artwork? Well, it's very important, of course. But most of the exhibitions I've had have been self-curated in the sense that I presented a body of work to a curator and allowed them a selection from it. 
but the initial um, series of images of works have been my choice. Um, I have a very clear vision of every exhibition I do in my head before I begin. Everyone thinks this is a retrospective, it's not. It's all new work made in the last 18 months. Um, I'm still <coughs> waiting for a retrospective. Anybody out there? No? Um, has there been an increase in public acquisitions for art by women in Scotland during your lifetime? When were you first aware of this? Well, um, the situation is pretty appalling, actually, <laughs> uh, in terms of uh, numbers of works by female artists in public um, collections nationally, internationally, locally, nationally, internationally, you name it. Um, but uh, it's changing, and it's changing for the better, and actually the Gallery of Modern Art has been pretty good at uh, acquiring works by women artists for their collection that um, have balanced the books a little. Um, but I don't know if any of you remember, <coughs> excuse me, I'm losing my voice, in the 80s, a group called the Gorilla Girls in New York. Yeah, well, they had some statistics about women in collections and galleries and shows that blew my mind. It was so scandalous. Uh, anyway, um, the last one is crazy because there's no way I can answer it. Who do you consider to be the most interesting artist woman, woman working in Scotland today? Well, if you've got time, I could name about a hundred, mm -hmm. uh, but there's no way I'm going to name one woman. Mm -hmm. um, I, I probably had about 500 students go through my sticky fingers at GSA uh, and, and some of them have attained international success, some local and national, but all of them I'm extremely proud of because they've all in their different ways I think understood the centrality of art to any culture worthy of the name. Uh, where did we get to? You've answered all the email questions. Right. Sure. I wanted to ask you um, about Louise Bourgeois because I okay. saw her artist reading today in uh, Aberdeen. Uh -huh. Good for you. Um, indeed, um, it's worth a visit up north. Um, I'm just struck by some of the parallels that I encounter when I look at Louise Bourgeois. I mean, she's quite a fan of red as much as anything else. Um, but also the sense of power and comfort, joy and agony. Um, I couldn't help but notice, Sam, um, when I was in your studio, that you had a Louise Bourgeois postcard tapped to your wall, and that made absolute sense to me. Sure. Um, so I just wonder how you um, relate to um, Bourgeois' feminist practice and her serious generation. Yeah. I mean, she <coughs> I, re <coughs> I recently spoke at a conference in Newcastle called Creativity and Aging. Thanks, pet. <laughs> uh, <laughs> anyway, I told the, I told the organiser it should be called Creativity and Ageism. <laughs> which didn't go down too well. <laughs> anyway, in it, um, I talked about um, the number of women artists now, possibly for all sorts of complicated reasons, who are still making work in their 60s, 70s, 80s, even 90s, uh, and male artists too, and how that is a big change. Um, and so... You know, to see some of the work of Louise Bourgeois in the, fr in the flesh and also see photographs of her with a giant penis under her arm <laughs> thrilled me to bits. Um, you know, she is an icon and I'm fascinated by her 
psychogeography, if I can call it that, (laughs) Um, complex personal history, complex autobiography. Uh, But in the end, you know, the work stands up for itself or it doesn't. Um, So although I think my work is incredibly autobiographical, I don't think it's important that people know my autobiography in order to understand the work. Mm -hmm. Um, But there are some things, uh, if I can just Mm -hmm. jump in, Mm -hmm. Katrina, that I meant to read out earlier. And one of the reasons I brought my notes is because I constantly forget things that I'm supposed to say uh, or that are important to me to say. There's a book called Islander, A Journey Round Our Archipelago by Patrick Barkham. And in it, he talks about G.H. Lawrence, the man who loved islands. Who knew? Um, And this is a quote from the book. When the mainland or mainstream is in crisis, people look to the periphery for escape or inspiration. Many of us are looking there right now. Small islands may offer a critique of our larger island life, but most they also provide salvation for our epoch. Mm. So that was interesting to read. Uh, next thing is, I've lost him, where is he? No, not him, sorry, it's, ah, here he is. There's a New Zealand artist called Colin Khan that I came across when I was in Australia and New Zealand many years ago. Um, Whose work I loved. Apparently, he lost his mind when he was representing New Zealand in the Venice Biennale many years ago, which one could understand in the context. Um, These are three quotes from Colin McCann, written in 1971. The first one says, I am not painting protest pictures. I am painting about what is still there and what I can see before the sky turns black with soot and the sea becomes a slowly heaving rubbish tip. I am painting what we have now and will never get again. 1971, he wrote that. How prescient is that? Mm. Then he says, most of my work has been aimed at relating woman to woman to this world, to an acceptance of the very beautiful and terrible mysteries that we are part of. I aim at a very direct statement and ask for a simple and direct response. Pretty good. Then the last one, my painting is almost entirely autobiographical. It tells you where I am at any given point in time, where I am living and the direction I am painting in. In this present time, it is very difficult to paint for other people, to paint beyond your, beyond your own ends and paint directions as painters once did. Once the painter was making signs and symbols for people to live by, now he makes things to hang on walls at exhibitions. Mm. But that was pretty good. Okay. Right, last two. Annie Dillard, wonderful American writer, <coughs> wrote an essay called Right Till You Drop. Mm. Do you know it? I don't, mm. but please. The writer, this is one quote. She was talking about how writers describe things from different places to home. Write about winter in the summer, describe Norway as Ibsen did from a desk in Italy, describe Dublin as James Joyce did from a desk in Paris. Willa Cather wrote her prairie novels in New York City. Mark Twain Twain wrote Huckleberry Finn in Hartford. Recently scholars learnt that Walt Walt Whitman rarely left his room. And this is Annie speaking. The writer studies literature, not the world. She lives in the world, she cannot miss it. If she has ever bought a hamburger or taken a commercial airplane flight, she spares her readers a report of that experience. She is careful of what she reads, for that is what she will write. She is careful of what she learns, 
because that is what she will know. So, last quote. There's a wonderful book by Catherine Rundell called Why Adults Should Read Children's Books. Uh, and in this book, she quotes Ursula Le Guin, science fiction writer, one of my favourites. We live in capitalism, its power seems inescapable, but then, so did the divine right of kings. Any human power can be resisted and changed by human beings. Resistance and change often begin in art, very often in our art, the art of words and pictures. And Catherine Hepburn, in an old film called Adam's Rib, when she questions her secretary about the moral double standards of the day, her secretary very defensively says, I don't make the rules. Sure you do, says Hepburn. We all do. <laughs> so, back to your question, Sam. Well, I think that's a very powerful way of answering my first question about portability. Thank you, Sam. That was so rich and there's so much to unpack and think about there. Um, I just want to return briefly to your point about creative agents. I think it's very pertinent and I think it's important that we consider this. There's a kind of doggedness, I think, to um, making art after having taught for a career. Um, and I am very interested in artists who actually were non engineerians and centenarians, Leonora Carrington, Dorothea Tanning, um, that generation of um, feminist surrealist practice, as you well know. Um, and what I found in my research was actually that repetitive gestures, repetitive activities actually kind of staved off some of the um, effects of dementia potentially. So ideas around knitting, sewing, singing. Mm. And there seems to be some of that actually at play in your own work and I just wondered if you wanted to comment on that. Sure. Um, uh, when I was a student in painting in Newcastle, I was told I couldn't sew because it wasn't fine art. Mm. Uh, so I immediately sewed everything in sight. Yes. Um, and I'm very interested in the fact that some of the earliest fragments and, and indications of human civilization are fragments of fabric, of textiles, the warp and the weave. And I'm fascinated by grids, and I love the work of Agnes Martin, and so on, and so on, and so on. So there is a, for me, a link between certain kinds of structures and certain kinds of what might be described as female craft uh, knowledge, um, which goes back thousands of years, of course. Um, so I'm, <clears throat> I'm kind of interested in the fact that all the women artists that I've admired over the years have kind of intuitively understood this uh, and, and, mm -hmm. and I've kind of recognised it in their work. Mm -hmm. Sorry. You will get a chance to ask questions. Um, I just want to ask a few more. Um, so your work often has a bodily or anatomical dimension. And you were very eager to point out in previous talks the kind of parallels or analogies between calcification and sort of rock formations in the landscape, you know, that kind of stratigraphy. So I'm very interested in that aspect of your work. Right. Well, uh, sorry, I keep forgetting about this. Um, years ago, I read an amazing book by an American Chinese geographer called Yi Fu Tuan, who wrote a book called Space and Place. He's written many books on uh, the relationship of the landscape to human life, human behaviour. Anyway, in one of these books, he talks about the ancient Chinese philosophy that linked um, imagery in the landscape to the human body. So boulders and rocks were bones, rivers were hair you know, that there was a definite connection between the landscape and the human body. And that's fascinated me ever since. So I can't see uh, an image in the landscape and an image of the interior of the human body without drawing parallels. Um, it's clear to me that since 
some of the books that influ influenced me when I was an art school student, like um, uh, From the Centre, mm -hmm. Lucy Lippens, mm -hmm. Feminist Essays on Women's Art, which sustained me through my uh, student years. Um, but also um, a book called On Growth and Form by Darcy Thompson, mm -hmm. where he relates structures in nature uh, to human forms and landscape forms and to architecture and to, you know, everything in the world. I mean, it was a real eye-opener of a book. And many years later, I had a two-person show at the Glasgow Print Studio called After Growth and Form, where I revisited some of the um, ideas in the Darcy Thompson book. Sorry, maybe forgotten <laughs> what the question was. Yeah, no, I'm fascinated in that response to this amazing naturalist who's really from my neck of the woods around um, <laughs> Dundee and St Andrews. So sure. Yes, absolutely. Sure. Um, excellent collections of Darcy Thompson if you want to go and see them. Um, I just want to sort of touch on the activist dimension of your work. You mentioned um, political paintings a moment ago. And I think your, your presence has been quite significant to driving that force, I think, in the student body. And thinking about nuclear disarmament, among other issues of our time, um, I can't help but wonder if there's an eco-feminist dimension to your work as well. If there's what? Sorry. An eco-feminist. Oh. Um, <clears throat> Well, uh, I'm not quite sure what that terminology might disclose, mm. certainly about me, but feminist, yes, uh, interested in the devastation of our planet by human activity, for sure. Um, but I don't think that that is necessarily... A, a, solely a feminist concern mm -hmm. um, and I think we are now in where well, we're very close to you know temperatures rising so much that things are going to get very very bad in the future uh, and my belief is that only by concerted action by governments, not individuals, can this be prevented? And they are so bad at doing that. Um, yes, I'm very concerned about what we are doing to the planet and, and what may happen in the future, but I also uh, am an internal optimist. <laughs> uh, I still have hope that we can avoid the worst of... Uh, what might be coming our way. And um, I believe that if human beings cease to exist, the planet might still survive without us. Um, and that would be, of course, an appalling tragedy, but we might have brought it on ourselves. <laughs> I invite any questions from the audience at this point. I want to make sure that you get your chance. If you raise your hand, Katie will appear magically from somewhere and will deliver the microphone to you. With a working microphone, we have to hope. <laughs> it's quite a nice microphone when you get used to it. Anyone want to ask a question? No? I can keep Or going. even make a comment. <laughs> yes. I was just curious um, who it was that you had quoted that was the political artist. Say again, sorry? You had quoted somebody talking about political art. Uh-huh. And I was wondering who that was. Okay, I think it was your first quote about political painting. Oh, right. Um, no, it was to do with um, Colin McCann, I think, mm -hmm. the quote. Yeah. Um, <coughs> I mean, I think you can think of yourself as an artist first and foremost and a political artist secondarily, <laughs> and certainly Colin McCann did. Um, 
I mean, there's a wonderful quote by Robert Motherwell, abstract expressionist, who said, as an artist, I don't think I can change anybody's mind about anything, but as a person, I'm willing to man the barricades. Mm -hmm. And that's my definition of a political artist. Mm -hmm. (laughs) I think there was another question. I'm not sure, Sam, whether this is a question or comment. It's a few bit of this. Right. Um, what has struck me fresh about your work is it's something I think that made the environmental art and the murals department very, very special at a certain time in Glasgow, which one can see still in your work, and I think that one can see somewhere in the culture of Glasgow. And that is the fact that despite what the rest of the art school was doing, (laughs) in terms of media and environmental art, there was no mediaism. There wasn't painting as painting or sculpture as sculpture. It was, and and there was no, um, oh I don't know, uh, you know, and Especially, I think this is true about language, mm. because there is a kind of ideology the vision is vision, and in terms of art, it comes first. Yeah. And what is really, really refreshing about your work is the equality of, especially the literature, mm. with vision. And it's very refreshing, because I think that in some places in the art world, that's something which isn't always, you know, that's a very uneasy alliance. Mm, sure. And yet it has flourished through that particular, let's just call it an ideology mm. because I can't yeah. think of a better word, that came out of all environmental art and which is very, very much part of what your practice is. But it's also, I think, very clear to me that. Um, <clears throat> Glasgow School of Art and Environmental Art and the MFA played a very important part in the uh, dynamism of the visual art community in Glasgow for a long time. Um, In a way that was to do with how David Harding and I tried to inculcate in our students the importance of a sense of solidarity and community and and ethics, and how we tried to insist upon a certain kind of generosity of spirit so that you would support our other other artists. Now, I'm long out of the art school, 205 I think I retired, so I don't know what the current state of play is, but I would be very, very sad if that sense of community and and cooperation had been lost in the visual art community, because I think it's what differentiated it from any other city in the UK. Yes, I mean, I made that comment because your your first question Mm. as um, a curator, Mm. when you were thinking about conceptual art, Mm. and, you know, that, and Mm. conceptual art in a sense has kind of, it's dying a bit again, which is a shame. Mm. All Whereas, art is conceptual. <laughs> yes, exactly. In Glasgow, mm. there, there just was not that divide, mm. I think, mean, which yeah. was something that was able to, you know, get us Tristan Borland on one hand, yeah. and, and the wonderful painter, um, I'm thinking of Callum, I think, but well, I can't, can't remember his son, mm. mm. Sorry? Yes, well, Carol Mills is from Edinburgh, but yeah. there was another wonderful painter who graduated. Noah Sater Strong, no. Oh, no, he made all these wonderful kind of academic paintings. He graduated at the same time with post grad with me. Oh, God. <laughs> Brain <laughs> death. Right, yeah, I know. Oh, 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 yeah, I know what you mean. It's yeah. like almost as if we came 
to the traditional disciplines in art from a very different viewpoint and ethos. So the painting in environmental art wasn't like the painting in the painting department, nor was the sculpture like the sculpture in the sculpture department. Not to denigrate those departments, but just to say there was a sense of difference. There was a sense of difference. And it was to do with the whole concept of uh, context. There's context in my mind and being able to use those things yeah. with the only kind of you know, hard for anyone who should be doing this. Sure. Thank you so much. This is really interesting from my research. I really appreciate that. Um, it made me also think of another um, aspect we have in common, Sam, which is that we've both at various points in our lives um, been affiliated with what is now Leeds Arts University. Um, I think when I started it was Leeds College of Arts, and when you were there it might even have been called Jacob Kramer College after the Ukrainian painter. Um, and that obviously um, is famous for its foundation course, which I think you actually undertook. I did. Um, and that's based on Harry Thibron's teaching, which is in turn based on the Bauhaus teaching. And I just wondered if that was something which maybe gave you the foundations for um, what you managed to achieve at Glasgow. Thanks, Katrina. Um, as I said, when I was a student at Newcastle, I'd been to several art schools after foundation at Jacob Kramer College in Leeds, which was brilliant, mm -hmm. trying to find a decent, half-decent art school and failed miserably. Ended up in my hometown simply so that my parents could look after my young son <coughs> while I went through art school. Uh, but one of the things that I remember so distinctly from my year at Jacob Kramer's foundation course in 1972, mm -hmm. 73, was on day one, the tutors put all the women in one room in one studio, all the boys in another, and they asked the women to draw the internal wiring diagram of a set of traffic lights. And they asked all the boys to draw a diagram of how to knit a sock. And the drawings that came out of that were extraordinary. <laughs> they were really beautiful. And so each day, for a whole year, I had morning drawing from 9.30 to 12.30, then a group crit in the afternoon, and then you could do whatever you wanted the rest of the time. Uh, we were sent to live in a geodesic dome on the Yorkshire Moors for a week to live off the land. Uh, we would be given a topic every morning for morning drawing. Patrick Oliver, one of the tutors, came in and said, I live on a farm outside Leeds. I have only one goose. I would like you to draw games for lonely geese to play. <laughs> Try getting your head round that when you were a youngster. Um, but I have such brilliant memories of that year and it really informed my teaching when I became a teacher because I realised that actually I could do better than some of these male tutors I've had in Newcastle. Um, and, uh, and I brought a lot of those ideas and experiences and philosophies and attitudes into my teaching, certainly in the first year at Glasgow before uh, environmental art. Mm. So. We're reaching the end, so if anyone does have a burning question, now is the time to put your hand up. Um, that, again, is so interesting to me, just, you know, the whole history of the pedagogy. Um, I also, um, obviously, follow you um, avidly on Instagram, and I enjoy the Sound Chronicles immensely. Um, <laughs> all your amazing field trips that you took when you were teaching, quite something to behold, all the different places that you went to internationally with those students. It's really amazing. Um, what would a typical day at the actual Glasgow School of Art look like for you? Ooh, um, well... It depends whether it's environmental art or MFA. Uh, the MFAs were older, hopefully a bit wiser, um, and more independent in many ways. Um, 
But mostly my days were spent in one-to-one tutorials Mm -hmm. with a year group of students, Mm -hmm. you know, sometimes for an hour, sometimes less, sometimes more. I'm told that's no longer possible because of student numbers, which is a real Mm -hmm. pity because Mm -hmm. the absolute mainstay of an art school education is one-to-one tutorials in the studio. Um, And um, so a a day in the life, well, when I was heading up the MFA I was working 60 hours a week and I went in on Sundays to do paperwork because there wasn't time to do admin during the week. That's how bad it was. It took me getting ill before the art school gave me an assistant. So I don't recommend the teaching in art schools to anyone. Uh, It's a very stressful life. Um, But an average day would be mostly tutorials, sometimes group crits, sometimes uh, seminars about dissertations or uh, essay writing. Sometimes slideshows of work by other artists, sometimes a visiting artist, sometimes, you know, it's endless. We would take advantage of everything coming our way in Glasgow. And sometimes the most extraordinary things happened, you know, where a visiting artist would offer to do a day's teaching and then not take any money (laughs) uh, if they were quite well known. That was astonishing to me. so we were very fortunate. Sandy Moffat, who was head of painting, David Harding, who was head of environmental arts, Sam Ainsley, who was head of MFA, have been working together for many years now as AHM, Ainsley, Harding, Moffat, to try and educate the polit- politicians about the importance of art, visual art in particular, to Scotland's culture, without much success. Um, but they... I think have also sustained me through periods when we despair at some of the happenings, you know, like the fight, two fires of the Macintosh. Um, you know, there are things that really make us realise we were very fortunate to live through what we still call the golden years <laughs> of GSA. Uh, but some pretty awful things have happened since then, and I don't think uh, that there are people who are blameless. You were talking earlier about your female students, and you said that you noticed in them more than your male students that they suffered confidence in their work. Yeah. I was wondering how you, if when you go to create something, do you see something before you even start making it, and do you ever go away from that idea while you start, or do you strictly stay to that? Oh no, the work can change and develop um, quite, I'm oh, sorry, <laughs> the work can, you know, I begin with this picture in my head, but I mean, you have to realise that most of my work starts in a drawing about eight inches square. <laughs> Um, and then it has to go through various processes to get very large and so strange things happen you know when you enlarge things Um, and sometimes I accept them and sometimes I reject them Uh, but I think you know I used to say to my female students to have confidence in their work um, because It had never existed in the world before they made it. It's the thing about visual art. Every time you see a new image, it's never existed before. Mm -hmm. I mean, how many disciplines can say that? Mm -hmm. Uh, So, yeah, I thought it was part of my job to instill confidence in my female students. Mostly the blokes didn't need it, but one or two did. And sometimes I had to beat them. (laughs) Not literally. Um, But but in terms of, you know, shaking them to uh, 
understand that their work was really brilliant mm -hmm. and deserving of praise and deserving of being sustained and kept and continued with. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it wasn't always easy, mm -hmm. <laughs> but I tried. I think one of the things that's so fascinating about your work is your visual vocabulary and you were talking earlier about the microscope and I think what we see with your work is often moving from that micro to macro, it's mm. kind of synecdoche, a part standing for the whole and I'm just astonished by your your repertoire, your, your recurrence of motifs actually, these kind mm. of um, imagined archipelagos or um, womb maps, you I name know. it, you know, these really, really beautiful um, concepts that come together, these juxtapositions of ideas are, are really rich and I think very signature, in fact. Well, that's very kind, Katrina, but I imagine most artists my age, 73, have got quite some repertoire <laughs> of mm -hmm. imagery and influences and research and everything else. Mm -hmm. And mine happen to be peculiar to me but they are wide-ranging mm -hmm. and they are uh, linked to all kinds of disciplines beyond the purely visual art one, you know, into geolo geology, geography, architecture, natural forms, you, you know, biology. There are umpteen ways in which you feed yourself as an artist. Mm -hmm. You know, people used to talk about recharging your batteries. You know, every time I read a new book or see a new film or go to a fantastic exhibition, as I did with the Philip Guston in London, which was extraordinary, um, you come away renewed. You come away with, you know, fire in your belly <laughs> to continue uh, and to fight the good fight, you know, to keep going. Uh, it's so easy to give up. It's so easy to give up on the world, to give up on love, to give up on art, to give up on optimism, to give, you know, you name it. That's not my way. I refuse to give up. <laughs> that seems like a, a wonderful end point. Um, we do have one more question, is that all right? Quick we, have to, we have to be out <clears throat> by nine. Mm -hmm. I'm afraid. Less a question than another comment. Sam Inslee, I'm going to turn you off. <laughs> yeah. Um, and it's, it's like to what people have been talking about. You, you have a kind of graphic idiom mm -hmm. that has been developed between image and language, which is extraordinary. Thank original you. and yours. Mm. And it was one thing when you were walking around the gallery tonight that, and talking about your work, you were talking about it very much in terms of the symbolism of what it meant to you. And you said very little about how formally <laughs> that was actually being realised <laughs> through colour, through line, mm. through cobalt blue. Mm. Through yeah. You know, through, through bits where in the little ones we were hiding. I own up, Jane. I, you are absolutely right. I did not refer to it once. You did. <laughs> I'm so sorry. I, I, but it's very, I think it's worth mentioning because I think it mm. is part of that language, mm. that yeah. way in which those symbols come alive in your art. And last thing I'm going to say, right. And it's, I'm thinking about a very famous essay, the map is not the territory. <laughs> and Indeed. The territory is all yours, Pearl. <laughs> and it's wonderful to, be, to witness it and to be able to see it. There's a lovely uh, Borges story about a man who makes a map the size of the world. <laughs> you know, that idea that a map can be you know, this big, <laughs> yeah. or it can be the size of the world. <laughs> I, you know, there's something 
intellectually stimulating about the whole idea of maps and mapping that has remained with me for years and years. And uh, I still find it difficult to separate the kind of historical knowledge from my personal emotional connection with it. It's quite difficult. Anyway, uh, Katie Bruce, my lovely curator, uh, is uh, reminding me that we have to be out of here by nine, I'm afraid. so We have to end. But thank you all so much for being here tonight. I just want to say two quick things before um, we thank Sam. Um, the exhibition is on until Sunday, I believe, so please bring your friends and family. It's been extended till June. Excellent. Even June, better. 30th. Right, June, June 30th. So there's lots of time to still see it, to engage with it, to spend time with it. Sam also has work in the Women in Vault exhibition, which is coming to the National Galleries of Scotland shortly. So lots of chances to see her work. We look forward to that major retrospective, which is obviously very necessary, and I am excited <laughs> to see more. Thank you all so much for joining us tonight. And please.